So today we're going to be talking about a pivotal moment in the Sermon on the Mount. Now historically, as the gospel traveled westward, it seems as though this passage has been glossed over. And what follows after this statement in the Sermon on the Mount oftentimes overshadows what we are talking about today. And that's a tragedy in the truest sense, because you cannot begin to understand the purpose of the teachings in the Sermon on the Mount until you understand what Jesus meant when he said, Do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Andy Stanley is the pastor of North Point Ministries. Nearly 40,000 people attend his church on Sundays. And in one of his sermons, he said, Jesus' new covenant, his, co his covenant with the nations, his covenant with you, his covenant with us, can stand on its own two nail-scarred feet. It does not need propping up by the Jewish scriptures. The Bible did not create Christianity. The resurrection of Jesus created and launched Christianity. Your whole house of Old Testament cards can come tumbling down. The question is, did Jesus rise from the dead? And the eyewitnesses said he did. Now, many of us, upon hearing this, might nod our heads in agreement. We might affirm, yes, of course, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And immediately I would join in, join in and say, amen. And then I would rebuke you. <laughs> Because you missed what Andy Stanley was actually saying. Even more, you missed what Jesus Christ himself clearly taught. Let me read it to you again. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear not the smallest letter not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished therefore anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven but whoever practices these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. I don't know if Pastor Andy Stanley is aware of this, but when Jesus refers to the law and the prophets, Jesus was referring to the Jewish scriptures, the Old Testament. And I don't know if he is aware of this, but when Jesus said the smallest letter of the law and the least stroke of a pen in the law, this was a Jewish expression. The actual words here are jot and tittle. And the word jot is derived from the Hebrew letter yod, the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. The word tittle is in reference to the tiny markings in the Hebrew alphabet that often distinguish one letter to another. Tittles are barely noticeable, but they make a big difference. What is it that I'm trying to say here? Well, it's not about what I am saying. It is about what Jesus has said. We just had our Resurrection Sunday celebration a few weeks ago. Andy Stanley is saying, forget the Old Testament, forget the law, forget the prophets. We only need the resurrection. After all, we have eyewitness testimony of the resurrection in the Bible. You know what Andy Stanley has said recently? We don't need the Bible to know about the resurrection. There's a progression going on here. Or maybe it is better for me to say a deterioration. And I wish someone within his church would call him out on it. Because it is a 
dangerous game that he is playing. The entire Old Testament is written in Hebrew and a small portion in Aramaic. They use the same alphabet. And if Jesus said that one yod, one tittle, will not vanish from the law until all is complete, I suppose it is very important for us to get familiar with the law and the prophets to whom he is referring. Do you still not believe me? Let's just go back to that wonderful narrative that is often recited on Easter Sunday, the road to Emmaus. Luke 24, verses 25 through 27. Jesus said, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory and beginning with Moses and all the prophets? He explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. It doesn't seem like Jesus detached himself or his message from the Old Testament at all. In fact, he does not separate himself from the law or the prophets. And the only way you're going to know how Jesus explained the resurrection to his very followers, no less, is through the law and the prophets. What is it that we think that he was teaching them from? The book of Ephesians? Well, the, the book of Ephesians hadn't been written yet. Luke tells us that Jesus taught them from Moses and the prophets. Now, I don't have all day to rant about the gross injustice that has been done to the statement of Jesus by some snooty preacher that hasn't learned the first thing about apologetics. So let's get into how to understand what Jesus was saying because this is of dire importance. The law consists of 613 commands found in the first five books of the Bible. Some of them are odd and some of them are very reasonable. All of them were for the purpose of God establishing for himself a holy nation different from the rest of the world's people so that he would have a people that he could call his own. It is important to understand that. Some of these laws, like that concerning clean and unclean food, were specifically revoked by Jesus. Well, how do we make sense of all of that? You also notice that the Jews were supposed to make sacrifices at the temple to atone for their sins. Well, the temple is gone. How can they have their sins covered over anymore? It is because Jesus met all of the requirements of the ceremonial law. So he did not revoke these laws. He fulfilled them, meaning that being clean or unclean for the sake of making a sacrifice is no longer something that is expected of us. Priests make sacrifices and Jesus was our high priest. Not one of Jesus' teachings in the Sermon on the Mount finds its origin outside of the Old Testament. What is more impressive is that Jesus pointed out that merely going through the motions of the law isn't good enough. The heart of the law was what mattered. He went beyond the letter of the law to reveal the purpose of the laws. And we'll get into that more as, the series, as this series proceeds. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 6.14, Sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace. So wait, I'm confused now. Is the law gone then or not? Well, the answer is no. The law is not gone. And Paul was not advocating for disobedience to the law. In fact, in Romans 6, he was promoting obedience to the law. His case was that we are slaves to Christ. Thus, we should not disobey the commands of God. As Christians, though, as those who have faith in Christ and have rightly applied the blood of the Lamb to the doorposts of our hearts 
Every transgression we commit against God and against his law is credited to Jesus and was paid for by his death on the cross. Now, without the law, you would never understand that. Moses gave us the imagery where sin is transferred onto a scapegoat. We are alleviated of our sin. The scapegoat carries it all and dies with it. Thus, our sins are, uh, our sin dies with the scapegoat. In this instance, the scapegoat was Jesus Christ, who died for our sin and fulfilled the law of Moses as the only perfect sacrifice. Well, what of the law? The law remains. It will always, always remain until heaven and earth pass away. There is a curse upon the world, and the law reveals that uh, the law reveals that curse by exposing our unrighteousness. Paul wrote in Romans seven seven, "I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law, for I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, you shall not covet." The world has a problem then. If they are unaware of the law and the prophets, guess what? They don't know what sin is. Does it make sense to you why there's so much depravity in our culture and that the church as a whole sits back and nods its head in agreement with it? We sit back and say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, amen. The resurrection is all we need. The New Testament is all we need. When in fact, if we would sit down and read the New Testament, we would see that it points us back to the Old Testament so that we can even begin to understand the sacrifice and resurrection of Jesus. If we read our Bibles, we would conclude that our culture has a problem. But take heart. Don't lose hope. Jesus has indeed fulfilled the law and the prophets. We have a mediator in him. My fulfilling the law, your fulfilling the law, hinges not on your works. It hinges in your faith in him. Do you believe Jesus fulfilled the law? Do you believe that he was crucified and died? Do you believe he rose from the grave and ascended to heaven? That is our yes and that is our amen to the glory of God the Father. I'd like to thank you for joining me for today's sermon. My name is Bill Sang from Faith Presbyterian Church. You can join us on Sundays at 10.30 in the morning. Please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.